What's up guys, Dr. Gooden here with part four of how to program for resistance training from chapter 17 of the NSCA textbook, Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning. Now, all six parts to this mini series are linked down for you in the description below. And if you watch to the end of the video, you can also click on through to the next lecture that way. So without further ado, let's get into the lecture. Now this information comes from chapter 17 in the book Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning, written by Drs. Shepard and Triplett. Now we're on the fourth step for programming for resistance training, exercise order. An exercise order is the sequence of resistance exercises performed during one training session. So we're talking about an individual training session. Should you start with back squats or with bicep curls? Should you start with multi-joint movements or single joint movements? Do we put power exercises first in the middle or do we put them last? Now there's a lot of different ways that you can actually order the exercise selection depending on your goals and depending on your train of thought. But the NSCA lays out a really good framework for how we can make these exercise order decisions. So the first type of exercises that we want to employ are power exercises, other core or primary exercises. Remember we spoke in a previous video about how the NSCA uses the word core to actually mean primary. It doesn't mean like your abs and your midsection when they say core. So don't think, you know, planks and sit-ups, think back squats and bench press when they say core exercises. And then assistance exercises. So power first, then other core structural movements, and then your assistance movements. So power exercises such as the snatch, hang clean, power clean, and push jerk should be performed first in a training session. Now the reason for this is because Power is the most sensitive fitness characteristic to fatigue. Um, well, actually second only to speed. So if the athlete is experiencing any fatigue, power will fall off very quickly. And in fact, if you perform power movements in a fatigued state, is it really power training? Or if you're not moving fast enough, does it just become extra volume that the athlete is incurring, which is more to recover from without actually enhancing that athlete's ability to produce power? So we want those power movements to be first. Another reason we want power movements to be first is because they tend to be inherently slightly more dangerous, right? So think about performing a power snatch where uh, the barbell starts on the floor and then a miracle happens and it ends up over the athlete's head. Well, if you're a qualified coach, you know it's not a miracle, but to the untrained eye, it does look nothing short of fantastic. So the athlete does uh, performs a power snatch, the bar ends up overhead. In, in the presence of fatigue, there's just a lot that could potentially go wrong with this lift. Now, does it go wrong? ever? Well, sometimes, yeah, maybe it's not as catastrophic as a bar falling right on that athlete's head and killing them in a single blow, but perhaps they're just slightly off in their positioning and they end up tweaking the shoulder or a wrist, or maybe, um, you know, at the very least, they just miss the movement. They can't get under the bar because they're already fatigued. So we want to perform um, technical and power movements first in the training session when there's the least amount of fatigue and when the athlete can devote the most of their resources, of their especially their anaerobic resources, towards producing peak power. Next, we, we do our other core or structural movements. So back squats or uh, bench presses. I would say deadlifts would come next, but um, deadlifts just kind of fry you for the rest of the session. So depending on what else you have, if you have some other movements to do, you might want to do deadlifts last, unless you have uh, just kind of mindless low output uh, assistance work, uh, then you could do deadlifts before then. And then finally, we end with assistance exercises because these take the least amount of psychological arousal. We don't require a uh, very high uh, central nervous system output for these exercises, and they're just easier to do in a fatigued state. You could do curls all day long, and that's why gym bros who only do curls can stay in the gym for two hours because all they're doing is curls, and so they don't really get tired, right? Uh, but if you're doing your uh, power snatches or power cleans or other weightlifting derivatives, and then you go into your back squats or front squats and your bench press and uh, maybe your overhead press, you're gonna be pretty darn tired after that. And so, yeah, maybe you have some energy to do some you know, upper body uh, isolation movements, or maybe you have some actually useful assistance work for your sport, uh, like some, some extra glute work or hip thrusts or some back extensions uh, or what have you. And you might have energy for that. Now we have a couple different strategies for minimizing fatigue or for minimizing the time requirement in the gym. Now, the first that we're going to talk about is an upper and lower body uh, superset or alternating upper with lower body uh, movements. So this is a method that provides athletes more time to recover between exercises um, than if they were just doing straight sets 
or than if they were going from one uh, lower body movement to another lower body movement. So for example, um, if you needed to do front squats and overhead presses, maybe instead of doing straight sets of front squats or straight sets of overhead presses, you do a set of front squat and then you go and do a set of overhead press. You take about 30 to 60 seconds in between just to catch your breath and then you go and hit the next set. Now, this is great because it allows the musculature to rest. And while you're doing that overhead press, which will take you a minute or so, and then you take a minute or so between the overhead press and your second set of front squats, your legs just got three to four minutes of recovery, even while you were uh, you know, training your upper body with that overhead press. Now, you won't get the most optimal strength gains because you're still taxing your central nervous system. You still have your breathing rate elevated. Your, you know, your body has to output some energy for that overhead press, but it is a much more time efficient way to train. Now, if exercises are performed with minimal rest periods, meaning going from one to the next to the next to the next with little or no rest, this is actually called circuit training. And this is a great way to train if your main goal is to stress a certain metabolic system. So if we look at something like CrossFit or other forms of functional fitness training or uh, you know, MMA preparation, maybe circuit training uh, is highly advantageous. And it doesn't mean that circuit training is necessarily bad, but when we're in the weight room, are we really there to maximize our metabolic adaptations and our physiological adaptations, or are we there to increase our strength and power and uh, muscle size as well? And I would, I would argue that in the weight room, oftentimes our primary goal um, is size, strength, and power, and not necessarily uh, anaerobic endurance or anaerobic capacity and things like that. So there's definitely a time and a place for circuit training, um, but oftentimes we want to take sufficient rest and maybe use some supersets or compound sets in order to optimize gains, but we probably shouldn't be aiming to keep our heart rate elevated super high like we do with circuit training. So another example of a good superset is a push and pull exercise alternated. So we, we would just call this a push-pull superset. And so in this case, we're still using the same limb and there might be a slight overlap in some of the musculature that we're using, but we allow the primary uh, musculature or the prime movers, the prime agonists, for each movement to rest in between. So maybe we do bench press and then we, we rest 30 to 60 seconds and we go and do some chin-ups. And so mostly different muscle groups are used, but there's some slight overlap. Uh, for instance, you know, the long head of the triceps works when you're at that bottom position in a pull-up, which you should be because you're doing full range of motion. And so you don't get complete recovery, but you do optimize the time that you're spending in the weight room. So alternating upper and lower or push and pull exercises can be great methods of supersets. So we've been talking about supersets, which is a method of alternating the muscle groups that you're training, but another type of set is called a compound set. And a compound set involves uh, sequential exercises of the same muscle group. So in this case, we might be talking about something like performing a bench press and then hopping off the bench and performing a set of push-ups. Now, why would you wanna do this? It's a method of accumulating more volume. It's also a method of injecting uh, exercise variation into your program. So, you know, you hit a certain subset of your motor units when you're bench pressing, and then you hit a slightly different subset of those motor units when you hop onto the ground and you do push-ups. just because the movement pattern has changed ever so slightly enough to stress different motor units in a different way. It also allows us to go from a more intense exercise to a less intense exercise. So bench press, uh, maybe you're doing, you know, a set of five or a set of 10, and then you hop off and you can do a set of 20 or 30 push-ups. So it allows you to accumulate volume, get more of a muscle pump, and really fatigue or exhaust that muscle. Now, should our athletes always train that way? Maybe there's a time and place for it. It's more of a bodybuilding uh, method for encouraging more muscle growth and uh, more time under tension, more mechanical tension, etc. Now, compound sets can also be used to pre-fatigue or pre-exhaust the muscle group. For instance, if you are really interested in using your triceps or in, in overloading your triceps, you might do a set of triceps extensions or tricep pushdowns and then hop onto the bench press and bench press because now your uh, triceps are not only pre-fatigued, but they're probably full of blood and they have a muscle pump and you have a good mind-muscle connection with the triceps. And so then when you bench press, you're really gonna feel them on that bench press, especially if you do something like a close grip bench or you know like a Swiss bar bench press and you really feel those triceps that you just worked on the triceps pushdowns. And the last form of set that is actually not on my slides, I forgot to write it down, but we should mention are uh, complex sets or complexes rather. And a complex is when you perform a string of different movements in the same set. Uh, weightlifting athletes often use complexes in order to improve different components of their weightlifting skill or technique. For instance, 
a weightlifter might do a clean pull, followed by a hang power clean, followed by a front squat, followed by a jerk, right? And so that's, uh, what was that? Four movements, four or five movements strung together, but each one is working on a specific component of the full weightlifting movement, which would be the clean and jerk, right? And so instead of doing a full clean and jerk, um, they're, they're really spending time on each of the smaller subcomponents of the larger technique for that movement. Or it might be something as simple as a front squat followed by a jerk. The front squat to pre-fatigue the legs and give them the feeling as if they had just cleaned the, you know, a massive weight, and then they go into the jerk uh, on those tired legs. So there's a ton of different ways you can implement complexes. Uh, those examples were from Olympic weightlifting, but let's say that you have a linebacker who needs to be able to punch through the offensive line, sprint at the quarterback, and then dive and tackle the quarterback to make the sack. Well, maybe you would do some sort of a complex involving uh, front squats and a jerk, because the front squats, maybe they do a set of five, could simulate right that force production that they have to exert to get past the offensive line, and then that jerk shows that they have the explosive power to make that fast sprint to grab the quarterback and make the sack. So we can use complexes, compounds, and supersets to not only diversify training, but really to optimize the time that we spend in the gym and to target the appropriate fitness characteristic that we're trying to target for that day. Okay guys, so we start off with power exercises. We move to our primary or core or key lifts next, and then we finish off with assistance work. And then we can use supersets, compound sets, and complexes to make sure that the exercise we've selected are targeting the exact things that we want to target and improve. Whether that's a certain fitness characteristic or it's a specific movement pattern or you're targeting time under tension or you're targeting uh, you know, max strength or power development, whatever it is, we can utilize these components to ensure that our exercises are in the right order for every session, no matter what the goal. All right, guys, now, if you had any questions about those comments, let me know down in the comments below. There's a ton more to talk about on those concepts and we could really dive into the nitty gritty if you wanna do that and maybe you know, make suggestions, I'll make future videos uh, about those topics if you're interested. But the next thing to talk about concerning programming for resistance training is loading and repetitions. So go ahead and click on over to the next video that I have talking about that important concept, and I'll see you guys over there in the next video.